thank you so much. Would you pray with me as we get to the next part of our service? God in heaven, Father, we dedicate this time to you, Lord, and we just pray that your name would be honored here, um, that you would be glorified in everything that happens. Thank you, Lord, that your presence has already blessed us. And as we have sang and shared and learned and given and done all these things, Lord, you have been with us. And we just continue to invite your presence to be with us. So we pray this in your name. Amen. All right. I do have a children's story. Um, and I'm going to jump right, or excuse me, a children's story, a kid's quiz. Uh, and so I'm going to jump right into that and uh, I'd love to have the kids participate with us here. This is all about uh, an individual in the Bible by the name of Josiah, Josiah. And uh, we've had a couple of Josiahs uh, here in church before, so I don't know if any of them named Josiah are here at the moment. But uh, let's see what the young people know about King Josiah. So if you want to help out, how is King Josiah sometimes known uh, in his uh, story in the Bible. Is he the shepherd king, the boy king, the reformer king, or the wicked king? I'm going to give Ryan a chance up here in front. Ryan, what do you say? Hey, he says the reformer king. Is there any others that want to also? I'll give one or two. All right, back here. The boy king. Yeah, in a way, you're both right. Um, the boy king is often thought of as Joash, but both Josiah and Joash become kings. One was seven and one was eight. I think Josiah is actually seven when he became king. Joash was eight. So they're both sometimes called uh, the, the boy king. And he Hezekiah is sometimes also remembered as the reformer king. But both um, Hezekiah and Joash, uh, excuse me, and Josiah are known for great uh, times of reformation. Shepherd king is usually David. And the wicked king is most of them, actually. There's no single. You know what? You might think of Manasseh maybe as being one of the worst, uh, but most of the kings of Israel and Judah were quite wicked. Um, it's, it's, it, was an, it was a rare thing, actually, for a king to follow uh, the Lord with all of their heart. Number two, what was found when Josiah was king? It's a very interesting story. Uh, they're cleaning up a part of the temple, I think it was. Uh, well, maybe I shouldn't say much. <laughs> Is it the Ark of Noah? Did they find the Ark of the Covenant, a book of the law? Or maybe it was a talking donkey or a four-leaf clover. You know, we just had St. Patrick's Day. It's possible. All right, Leah. Okay, she got it right off the bat, so thank you very much. A book of the law. We, we believe it was probably the scroll of Deuteronomy is what most scholars believe that was and most commentaries you read. Imagine losing that and not even really knowing it's gone. This is how, uh, you know, after generations of wickedness, these things happen. There were idols everywhere in high places and pagan, and they just totally neglected and forgot and lost the book of the law. That's, that's a, an amazing thing, but they find it. All right. So in this process of discovering the book of the law, Josiah sought prophetic counsel from someone. Do you remember the name of the person he went to? Is Jeremiah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Huldah. Maybe it was Ellen White. <laughs> okay, I want to see if... Okay, I'm gonna, I know you've answered one. I want to see if get more people involved. So Gloria is going to help us out here. She got it. It, it was Huldah. So it was actually a female prophetess who was able to give counsel. And it's very interesting when you read the story of how Huldah uh, replies to Josiah. Uh, there's a lot of in, uh, uh, inference in there. But it's interesting that Jeremiah, Zephaniah, and Habakkuk all were prophesying at this time. It's not like uh, he had limited choices. All right, there was, uh, there was some uh, role of the Spirit guiding him to Hulda, where she was able to give him counsel and say, look, uh, you're now accountable. You found this book of the law. You need to read it. You need to embrace it. And you need to follow what it says because uh, Judah has been ignoring the will of God. So he goes and he gets prophetic counsel from one of the few female prophets in the Bible. Number four, and this is the last one. I just did four of them today. Um, according to 2 Kings 23-25, what was the most important thing, the most important thing that King Josiah did? Was it that he turned to the Lord? Was it that he reinstituted Passover? He removed idols, repaired the temple, or he fought Pharaoh? I see Ryden's hand up here. Ryden, can you shout it out for me? 
He, you, you're right, he did do that, and that was wonderful, but it's wrong. <laughs> no, you did, you're absolutely right. You know the story well, but that, that's not what the Bible says. It's the most important thing that he did. Okay, so Owen, what do you have to say? He did do that, and that was a great thing, but that's not what the most important thing he did. All right, we're going to give Gloria a chance. He, she says he turned to the Lord. And she's right. <laughs> I want to show you what the verse says here. 2 Kings 23, 25. Before him, there was no king like him who, what's it now? Say, say it together. Turn to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. The thing that Josiah would be known for, the thing that the scriptures uphold about Josiah, he did many wonderful things, but it was the passion, it was the conviction, it was the determination on his part when he understood better what the will of God in his life, uh, what the will of God for his life and his kingdom was, he put his full energy into that, and he did many wonderful things, but it was that personal decision of Josiah to turn to the Lord. You know, 2 Corinthians says, whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. In other words, the thing that separates you from understanding, the thing that separates you from God, the thing that separates you from wisdom, when you turn to the Lord and you give him your whole heart, that veil is taken away and God does amazing things in your life. I want to invite my wife to come up here with me. And we are going to... Brenda, can we go blue? Oh, green. She would like green. Is that available? Oh, sorry, that's not available. Okay, I guess you get green. <laughs> you want this one? Come up here, right here. We would just like to share um, kind of a testimony um, about how we uh, came to understand what God was asking of our, our life. You, you're going to be all right? You want to trade? Oh, okay, I gave you the padded one. <laughs> um, about how we became Seventh-day Adventists. We did not grow up uh, in this church, in the Seventh-day Adventist church uh, or culture. And um, uh, that transition came into our life uh, after we were married, actually. And I've shared snippets of that and, and little, little uh, anecdotes here and there. Uh, but we're just going to kind of talk from the heart and just kind of tell our story, if, if that's okay. And... Um, uh, we think that it's something that uh, is a, a good thing that God did in our lives. So we were both raised Pentecostal. We were both raised Christian. We grew up in the church. We were very faithful in going to church. I grew up in the type of uh, church context when, whenever the doors of the church were open, my family was there. Uh, you know, and we had services Sunday morning, Sunday night, every Wednesday night, and then there would be other uh, things uh, during the, the season that we were there. But very dedicated Christian family. Um, uh, Gina also has roots in Pentecostalism, but uh, growing up um, in, with an Air Force father, they moved around a lot, and sometimes it would just be whatever Protestant service was available on base. Or, um, but usually you guys sought out um, a Christian church that was uh, Pentecostal as well. Yeah. And so our denomination was actually called the Assemblies of God. The largest single denomination in the world right now is the Assembly of God denomination. There are more Baptists in the world, but they're divided into about 15 different Baptist, uh, you know, branches. The Assembly of God uh, denomination is the largest denomination in the world, about 60 million. Last time I looked at it, 60 million identify in the world as um, a Pentecostal Assembly of God, and we were very faithful. Um, now, I don't want to go into a lot. You, you may know a lot about denominations. I'm not going to explain all the nuances. Um, I actually brought the Bible I grew up with, and I've always had this pattern of putting uh, my Bible in a protective cover. Um, and so this I got when I was about 10, and had this throughout most of my teenage years. And I actually wrote the beliefs of the uh, um, Assembly of God Church in my Bible. And um, there are four cardinal beliefs that they are usually known for. Now, you have to remember, the, the, the lines between denominations have become very fuzzy these days. And the whole distinction between what makes a Baptist, what makes a Presbyterian, what makes an Adventist, yes, even in Adventism, the lines have gotten fuzzy. Um, they're not as distinct as they used to be. But typically, uh, a Pentecostal Christian, there's four 
cardinal things that identify what they are. One is salvation through Jesus Christ. So they are a Christian group. You know, they believe uh, very much in Jesus Christ, but they're dispensationalists. So they believe in different dispensations that God has brought salvation through. We're not going to get into that. That's for the advanced class, Derek, and, and we'll get that later. All right, buddy? Okay. Secondly, divine healing. Uh, Pentecostal strongly believes that divine healing should be manifested in God's church in the last days. So many Pentecostal services, just like we've had prayer and we've had offering, they would have a healing part of the service. And you just every Sunday, you would come forward if you want to be healed of a whatever. Okay, we're not going to get into that. Uh, third, which is what most of us think of with Pentecostals, is speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues. And I don't mean Spanish or, or French or anything like that. This is that uh, charismatic babbling, for lack of a better term. And I don't mean to be uh, disrespectful. Uh, you know, I want to be gentle to, to people of different backgrounds of faith. But it is that uh, manifestation of being baptized in the Holy Spirit to the point you go into a sense of ecstasy and you begin to uh, have a language that no one can understand. That is what Pentecostals are often known for. And then lastly, they are very passionate about the second coming of Christ, uh, mostly in a context of a secret rapture a secret rapture. So that was the culture of Christianity that we grew up in and, and embraced and loved, and most many of our family continue to be in that, and um, um, they're good people, wonderful people. Um, and uh, we could share anecdotes about that. But so the way it transpires in 1999, uh, Gene and I got married. Yeah, it was wonderful, 1999. Um, and it was only a few months after we got married um, and I don't remember exactly, probably November-ish of 99, I was working at Costco, and a, a friend of mine who was actually my supervisor, who he knew I was a Christian, and he was a Christian, he was a Seventh-day Adventist, and I didn't even know that at the time, but he would just ask me about biblical things, and one day he asked me, are you interested in prophecy? And that's how he asked, are you interested in prophecy? Now, I wasn't that much but I couldn't say no. I mean, as you have to if you're a believing Christian. I mean, you, you are interested in prophecy. So I, mostly out of politeness, mostly out of just being, you know, having to answer the right thing, I said, well, yeah, I'm interested in prophecy. I was actually at the time reading the Left Behind series books. Do you, do you guys remember that hysteria that was kind of going through the late 90s and early 2000s, the left behind. They made movies out of it and everything. I was reading that series of books at the time. I was in the fifth book, Apollyon. There were 12 of them. I'd read the first four. I was reading Apollyon at that time. So, yeah, I guess I could say I was interested in, in prophecy because I was reading that fictional prophetic um, uh, book about what it would be like if everyone just disappeared. Anyways, so he goes, are you interested in prophecy? Says, yeah, I am. He says, well, I've got these videos. You're going to love them. They're, they're about prophecy. I, will you watch them? And again, more out of politeness than anything. I didn't really want to watch them. But he was my friend, and we had been talking. I said, okay, yeah, I'm excited. And so he gave me um, some videos. This was back when they had cassette tapes, kids. Yeah, VHS. That's a cassette tape. VHS. You'll learn about these in museums someday, Ryan. Okay. So he gave me tapes. And I, I, I worked a different schedule than Gina, and I had some time in the afternoon, so I went home and just, because I knew he was going to ask me about them, I plugged him in and I watched them. And it happened to be, you guys may remember when Doug Batchelor was here in our service, I mentioned this. It was the Millennium of Prophecy series that Doug Batchelor had just freshly recorded in Manhattan. And it's a standard evangelistic series, right? If, if you've been, uh, been through one or seen one before. And I watched him, and you know, he's a good communicator. He's, he's funny at times, and he has, uh, you know, just a good communication. And the first few videos, he didn't give me the whole series. He just gave me the first few. They're all very standard Christian stuff. We believe in the Bible. We believe in salvation by Jesus. You know, nothing really controversial in the first few. Although I have to say, the very first, you know, in a standard evangelistic series, you start with Daniel 2, don't you, Sandy? It's usually Daniel 2. I, can, I looked at Daniel 2, how a lot of Adventists look at Daniel 11. They just see, well, it's a bunch of stuff. We can't really understand it, but it's nice that it's there and there's all these images and stuff. Um, Tim, I did not really know that Daniel 2 could be so easily understood. No, I mean Daniel 2, the statue, the statue. Yeah, no, I know you, you yeah, I know there's more about Daniel 12 there, brother. But um, So I was quite taken in by that. And um, 
Uh, so anyways, I watch them, and if, when, first thing when I come back to work, I think it's the very next day or, or a few days later, my, my friend at work, his name's Ron, he would say, so what'd you think? And uh, I said, well, you know, it's good. I, you know, I liked how he shared from the Bible. I believe in the Bible. That's great. They believe about Jesus as our Savior and, and, the, the, and sin and all that. Yeah, it's fine stuff. Uh, he says, well, I got more. He was like a crack dealer, you know. You kind of get started, <laughs> and then he just give you a little bit more. And uh, he says, I got more. Would you like to watch more? And I, I said, well, uh, okay, sure. And wouldn't you know the very next video was on the Sabbath. And again, I grew up in the church. I, I loved Jesus. I believed in the Ten Commandments. had no problem with that. Uh, but I was shocked at how little I knew about the Sabbath when I saw the video and how much the Sabbath is integrated throughout the Scriptures. And I felt almost immediate conviction. And I began to continue watching the rest of the videos on the state of the dead and on um, hellfire and on the second coming. And immediately, and I'd been raised to believe that the Bible is truth. And if the Bible says it, you believe it, you follow it, you embrace it. And I could not believe that I was seeing things in the Bible uh, that made sense and that were so clearly taught uh, that I'd never seen before. And it was almost like I knew the pieces were out there, but I'd never seen them come together to create a picture before that was so, so well done. And I began to immediately felt conviction. So this is where Gina comes in. Um, I was watching, we've been married maybe six months at this time. And I was feeling deep conviction that I was learning things that I needed to study further and I needed to consider whether or not this is what God was calling into my life. And I've been watching these videos. I'd, I'd finished this series by this time and I've been talking with my friend at work and he'd been answering a lot of questions. And I knew at some point, I gotta tell my wife. We were very active in our church. We were both on youth staff, she led worship. We were there very consistently. We were not just casual parts of the church. We were leaders in our Assembly of God church. And so one day I said uh, to Gina, so are you interested in prophecy? <laughs> uh, and I, so I said, so let's watch some videos. And she's like, okay. And so we start watching them, and at the end of every sermon, at the end of every video, I'd go like this. So what'd you think? <laughs> and what did you think? Well, like Dave said, um, the, first, the first few videos were just about the Bible. And I had grown up my... Um, All right, let's try something different. Sounds Hello. Like very good. Sorry, should have checked that before. So, um, the first um, few videos were about the Bible. Um, my mom was. Uh, my dad did not come to church. He grew up Assembly of God. Um, my grandparents were fa very faithful, and my mom grew up uh, mostly with the Assembly of God family, and so um, I believed that the Bible was was truth. So those were not very difficult to to accept. Um, but it did feel like um, after a few, when I learned that Dave had watched all of the videos before he told me what he, what he had been watching, um, that this was, could be um, life changing. And I didn't know what that life changing meant. Um, would we do this together? Would we kind of split? And would I go the way that um, I was raised and where um, I was comfortable? Or would um, this be you know, how, how, this would, how this would work out. So we went through our own kind of personal journey at this point of, of talking together, praying together, studying together, and trying to figure out, you know, how we would move forward with this as I was uh, really convicted that I wanted to follow the Bible and um, I wanted to study more. And we just want to share kind of three areas of our life. We can't give, you know, every anecdote and every story, at the, you know, right at this time. We just want to share how this began to develop in three areas of our life. How we dealt with this with our church, our current Pentecostal church. How we dealt with our work, because both of us were working at the time, and, and there were times that we'd be working on Sabbath. And then how our families, how our families reacted to our journey as we were going on. And so beginning in the church, you know, we, we were recently married and we were very involved in our church. We valued our pastors 
and we valued spiritual leaders in our life, and we felt we needed to go to them for counsel, and we needed to talk with them and share with them. And so we did that on several occasions, sometimes just me, sometimes together we would go. I went out to lunch with one of them, uh, another one we would talk on the phone, and, and I would just begin to share my heart and say, I see the Bible saying that the Ten Commandments are still God's will for our lives, and that the Fourth Commandment, there's really only one way that the Bible um, says that it applies. It is the Sabbath day. It is the seventh day. And, you know, there's all the standard. How many of you also were converts older in life? So some of you have your stories and your journeys as well. So you, if, you've, if you've ever studied this before, you have these standard replies. You know, well, it was done away at the cross. Oh, okay, well, that doesn't make sense. Oh, okay, well, then it doesn't matter what day you do it. Well, if it doesn't matter, why are you saying I can't go on Saturday? It has to be Sunday. Let's go Thursday if it doesn't. So all these standard responses, and, and I would just share, I, I don't see that, and, and, and we need to find a way through that. These were not easy times for us. These are not easy times because you know what it's like when you start to have a conversation and it's clear that the two of you are not going to agree and you want to keep it good, right? You want to leave on good terms. But when it comes to certain things in life like religion and politics, those things get difficult to maintain. And so we had to at times realize that neither were going to uh, win over the other uh, and we had to, to be able to find ways to still remain friends and, and go a different direction. And so we, we did that, and um, there were some painful moments um, in, in that experience because we, we felt, and, and they felt. Remember, for, for most of the Christian world, Adventism is one step too far, okay? For most of the Christian world, if you're a Baptist and you become Methodist, no big deal. If you're a Nazarene and you become Presbyterian, no big deal, but for most of the Christian world, Adventism is one step too far. And so they felt um, not only that we were becoming, you know, um, um, you know, some other denomination, they thought we were becoming lost. They thought that we were being deceived. And in that context, sometimes emotions and other things um, can become uh, uh, elevated. Anyways, but I would share this. Through these experiences, God confirmed to us that we were going the right way. Wouldn't Absolutely. you say that? You want to say something? Absolutely. Um, I, I haven't shared my whole story, um, but I moved up to Yakima in 1996, having, needing to get away from some really bad influences in my life. Um, and so this church that I was a part of was family. They had accepted me. They had pulled me in. And um, not just family like my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and cousins, but other people in the church had been instrumental in me getting my life back on track. So um, learning these new things and really um, trusting that we needed to make a decision um, was really hard for me personally. Um, because I felt like I was cutting off part of my body um, to leave these people. Um, and I remember um, Dave and I went over to the pa one of the pastors that married us. He and his wife were wonderful. They still are wonderful. Um, and with these, I mean, can you imagine the pastor having some really important members of his church who helped out a lot saying, we're probably going to leave. We need, we, we, we feel like this might be um, what we need to do, um, feeling desperate. And, you know, he had called some um, professors that were specializing in cults and in, um, and some of them had studied Adventism and they'd made a different decision um, than we had made about what Adventism meant. And I remember praying, um, God, you have to show me that this is right because I feel like so broken and torn inside and we went to their house and um, got to talking about it and our challenges and it seemed in my mind that the pastor became very um, I don't know how to word it um, because he's a wonderful man and I've seen him since then passionate. and very passionate but I felt like he was, he turned into like a viper and he was attacking Dave 
um, my new husband and um, attacking this, attacking him more than me even. Um, and I remember that being the confirmation to me that, okay, things aren't always easy, but if you make the right choice, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to guide you. And I remember him saying to me, um, Gina, you can divorce him. You can leave him. He's causing, he's going to cause you to sin if you do this, Gina. Please don't do this. You belong, you know, with God. And I remember thinking, how can a pastor tell me that it's okay to divorce my new husband after just such a short time because of, because of a church? I mean, he knows Dave loves God. He knows I love God. And to me, that time um, was what I needed to see and hear. I needed to see that to know, okay, I'm with Dave. God, you've given us th these videos for a reason. Here we go. We're going to do this. And I remember crying so hard when we left our house because it was that we, we knew we weren't going to be able to make a um, compromise. And I remember Dave just gently and easily taking my hand, and we got up, and we left. And that was super hard. I mean, 20 years later, it's still really hard. Um, but I knew that God was with us. And I did feel a peace about our decision, even though I was bawling like a baby. <laughs> yeah, and again, I mean, everyone makes mistakes. This pastor's still a good guy. Um, you know, he got a little overly passionate maybe, and we've all been there. But during this time too, we had joined a Bible study led by um, one of the elders of the Adventist church there in Yakima, and we were able to ask a lot of questions, and we were able to kind of confirm some of these things that we were studying and learning. And it was about June of the year 2000, we decided we needed to go to an Adventist church for the first time. Now this is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate uh, as a pastor now about what it's like to walk through the doors of the church. I don't think I've ever felt weirder walking into an Adventist church on Saturday than I felt about walking just about anywhere. It just was so weird. And um, it, uh, it felt, you know, you put on your Sunday best, right? And you, instead of watching cartoons, which I did a little <laughs> bit back then <laughs> on Saturday mornings, uh, you were going to church. And we're going through all these emotional things at this time. Um, and the church was just very wonderful to us. They embraced us. There were greeters and there were people that knew we were new and were very kind. And, and I just want to share this uh, from my heart, too. I believe in a variety of evangelism. And in our life, the thing that helped us with our journey was no one kind of evangelism. It wasn't just Doug Batchelor, the Millennium Prophecy. It wasn't just my buddy at work. It was all these things working together. It was a beautiful church that recognized a new family that was searching and welcomed us in. It was a friend at work who was willing to share his faith in a gentle way, in a diplomatic way, and we were able to talk. It was an evangelistic series that got us closer to Jesus and the Bible. It was all these things working together, and I still believe that is the best model of evangelism. Don't just put 40,000 out and have a great speaker in. There needs to be relationships. There needs to be a culture. There needs to be uh, the rest of these things that go together. But anyways, we started attending the Adventist church there a, a, a little bit, and uh, we're, we're going together. Uh, trying to figure things out and all these things are happening. And we tried the going to church on both days for a while. Did any of you else do this where you went both on Saturday and on Sunday? Um, because again, uh, we, were, we, we knew our family was going to find out about this and there were going to be struggles and all these things. So we thought we'd kind of hide it for a while. You know, show up to church on Sunday and, and, and be there, but then also keep our, our Sabbath convictions and go to church on Saturday. We found that to be almost impossible. And that only lasted maybe a month, I would say. Not very long. Um, and, then, and then we had to just tell um, our family, we, we've decided we are more Adventist than we're Pentecostal. And that there are things within the Pentecostal church that while they're a beautiful congregation, and beautiful people, there are things that are just so um, irresponsible that we cannot continue to support that uh, element of Christianity with our, with our participation. And so we made the decision we're going to continue to be Seventh-day Adventists, and we actually felt it was significant enough that we decided to be rebaptized. So in February of 2001, we were baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Yakima, Washington. And Gina was pregnant with Bailey at the time, because <laughs> she was born in August of that year. 
So, all, so we're getting married, we're having babies, and we're changing religions, and all this within about a year and a half time. Wow. Yeah, and we're trying to buy a house and working in careers and everything else. So, you know, that's, that's amazing. So the, it began to get out to our families. Uh, and again, uh, these were trying times. Can you imagine if one of your family members came to you and said that they're joining an organization that you firmly believe is deceitful and wrong? Okay, so just put yourself in their shoes. You might get passionate as well. You, you, you're not just going to tap them on the shoulder and say, well, bless your heart, you know. If you're in the South. Yeah, if you're in the South, maybe you say that. You know, you're going to fight, right? You're going to fight, and you're going to argue, and you're going to try to pull them back. And again, just like with our pastors that we counseled with, we could see that there was going to be no reconciliation. And so we kind of, we kind of declared an armistice with our family. We just wouldn't talk about it. Uh, but yet we would still get the little notes, you know, for, for your birthday. You'd get the birthday card, happy birthday. And then they would write, you know, Second Thessalonians, whatever. And you look it up, don't be deluded by the things of the world, you know. <laughs> and um, family reunions were very unique for a while. Uh, we, we became Adventists. We accepted the health message. And so how we ate changed, how we lived changed. And... Um, um, I would say, I would say it took in the neighborhood of 10 years, in the neighborhood of 10 years before our family that were most passionate about this came to see that this was not just a phase or like a fad that we were doing, but we were serious about it. And they began to soften in their understanding. As a matter of fact, an uncle of, yeah, an uncle of mine, and I know this has been recorded, so I don't even mind if Uncle Four sees it, but he's kind of the, the, the spiritual patriarch of my uh, mom's side of the family. He actually has a pastor's license. He's very active in the Assembly of God Church. And about, oh, I'd say maybe 10 years ago, he, he patted me on the shoulder and he said, well, Dave, I've actually done some study and I've talked with a friend of mine who's also an Adventist and I finally decided you are gonna go to heaven. <laughs> or something like that. And he didn't mean, I mean, he was serious. But you know, we, we, we would have conversations and things like that. Um, and, and we could share just dozens and dozens of stories. Some of our family were very much accommodating, and they said, you know, that's fine. The Bible does say seventh day. I said, I guess that makes sense. Um, and we have large families. Not all of our families are Pentecostal. We have Lutheran and, and Catholic and Mormon, and uh, we have a, a, a lot of different uh, uh, religious background. I think that um, one thing with our families that was interesting and we talk about this all the time, um, our families that were the least active or the least religious were the ones that were the most accepting and accommodating. And um, my a, a cousin that um, is, he's older than I am, but um, he doesn't go to church, but he grew up, his parents um, as well, in the same family, Assembly of God Church that I had been to. Um, he actually said to Dave, well, you know, the Bible does say the seventh day, so you guys are doing the right thing. And so we still pray for him. I know that he is, um, I'm, I'm, I pray that, that God will really get a hold of him. He's and a good that guy. He's such he's a great guy, a and he guy. knows the Bible. And when he said that to me, I just was like, wow. I mean, this is my cousin who doesn't go to church, who, um, you know, has some struggles in his life. And, and even to him, it's so clear that the, that the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the seventh day is the day that the Bible says we should worship. And Dave's aunt, who's a Catholic, um, Aunt Gail, I love this lady. The minute I met her, she just embraced me. And I met David at quite a, kind of a weird time. We met time. in church. We met in an Assembly of God church. That's where we met. When we started dating, is what I'm talking about. When I met his family. And then that happened. His grandpa had passed away. Mm -hmm. And his grandma had fallen. And she had had a stroke. So I'm meeting the family at Christmas. We've just started dating. We've been friends for a couple years. And talk about awkward going into this family. But Aunt Gail has always just loved on us and loved on me. And she was so sweet and, and, um, and understanding. Accepting. And accepting of this strange thing we were doing. But, but they never gave us a hard time like our families that, that were more um, religious and were more active in their churches that kind of made us feel... Um, like outcasts 
in a way, if that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it, again, imagine. I don't think they meant they to. They didn't mean it like but that, but you really feel that someone you love is, is joining a cult, you know, and that's how they felt. Um, but I want to share, you know, I was learning this, and I became quite passionate, and I was about ready to convert the world. <laughs> and I was ready to convert my family. And I knew that if I could just get their attention for 15 minutes, uh, we would all be singing hallelujah together and joining, you know, the, the Adventist movement. Um, I found out it didn't quite work that way. And um, so, you know, I sat down with my parents, I sat down with some friends, and we went golfing together, and we would talk, talk Bible together when we golf. And um, it was striking to me uh, how ineffective I actually was um, and how strongly people will hold uh, positions. Even when I could get them to admit that the Bible was saying something different, they would say, no, I see where you're coming. The Bible does say that. And I say, well, then there you go. And they say, but I'm still not going to change. And that's actually quite common. And, and we do that in Adventism, friends, from time to time, too. Um, it's part of the human condition. It is possible to hold contradictory opinions at the same time. We do that all the time. Um, so anyways, I, I became very passionate, and there were you know, things I learned along the way. Uh, but I know time is, is getting away from us. There's just one other element I do want to mention, and that is how it impacted our work. Uh, because we did uh, want to follow what the Bible said about the Sabbath and not work on the, the seventh day of the week. Now, I'm going to let Gina talk first because you were working at a doctor's office. And my, my experience with work was not as challenging as Dave's, I don't think. Um, I worked Monday through Friday, you know, normal office hours. I was a receptionist. I scheduled their, their appointments and their lab. So um, when I'd been working there for a while, when I went to her and said, hey, um, I really need to have Friday afternoon at like 3 o'clock or 3.30 off when it's winter and the sun's going to set early. And, you know, I gave her all the, I mean, I was going to work till 5 every other time except for in the winter when at times in the Northwest, um, the sun sets at 3 or 3.30. And I really wanted to, um, as a new Adventist is trying to follow this, I really wanted to guard those hours. I mean, I am a nurse now and I do sometimes work or have had to work on Sabbath to provide uh, um, comfort and healing to people, so I don't have a burden about it now. But at that time, I really wanted to have um, Friday afternoons during the winter off so I could get home and, and kind of get ready for Sabbath. So my work was pretty accommodating, but I did, you know, there, were, there was one person that didn't really like it because they didn't get to leave early. And why did Gina always leave early? And Gina came after them. <laughs> but most of, most of them were very accommodating. Um, yeah, your work was able to work yeah. do that, and it wasn't as, you know, as significant a challenge if you work actually on uh, the, the, the daytime. And I would come in early on Friday so that yeah. I could get stuff done. So, so for me, I'm working at Costco, right? Now, if you know anything about a retail store, what's their busiest time? It's, it's the weekend. It's Saturday. And um, I had actually filled out, when I filled out my job application, that I was willing to work every day of the week. I mean, it asks you right on there. And uh, so um, I know that I'm going to be having a problem with that. So my friend who also worked at Costco, uh, but he was in a smaller department, was able to navigate his schedule around Sabbath. And I said, I want to do that too. And he said, well, let's go talk to the manager together. So the assistant manager's name was Jerry. I think it's important to note that Ron also recently converted. Yeah, he was a convert. So he had... Yeah, he, he was, was raised Baptist and mostly, and he has his own story, but 3ABN and, and television ministry was huge for him uh, learning these truths and joining. But anyway, so Ron and I go to meet with the assistant manager. His name's Jerry. And it, it, first it was Jerry. So um, one thing at Costco, you never stop moving. Um, that's one of their policies. You never stop moving. So even when you're talking, you're walking, you're doing something. And so we're walking along the front of the store and, and Ron says, well, my friend Dave has something he wants to say to you. And I say, Jerry... <laughs> Um, and we're walking, we're walking. I said, Jerry, I'd like to have Saturdays off. I've become a Seventh-day Adventist. And he stopped. <laughs> you don't do that at Costco. He stopped, and he did about the biggest eye roll you've ever seen in the world. And he looks at Ron, and he goes, you converted him, didn't you? <laughs> and Ron's just like, why don't we just talk, you know? And he said, I can't do it. I can't do it. You have signed that you will work on Saturdays. You're going to have to talk to the main manager. His name is Jay. Now, at Costco, the store manager is like someone you lower your eyes to. You know, they walk by and you kind of do one of these or something. <laughs> they are revered 
um, because they carry a lot of responsibility. It was a scary thing to go into Jay's office. So I, I make this a meeting with Jay, and Ron came with me. He was there for a kind of moral support, and I said, Jay, and he was a Christian, by the way. Um, I said, Jay, I, I've decided to keep the Sabbath and, and take Saturdays uh, off. I'd like you to accommodate me here. He pulled out my job application and sat it on the desk, and he said, Dave, you wrote right here. You're going to work on Saturdays. Are you lying? Are you, are you saying, did you lie when you wrote that? I said, Jay, uh, people change. Uh, yes, at the time I was honest about it, but I've, I've come to a different conviction. And then he started talking about, um, you know, the Sabbath and why we shouldn't keep it, da 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 And I said, I'm not really here to argue. I'm just, and I told him, I said, look, I realize I filled that paperwork. I didn't know all the laws, right? He could not have fired me. I didn't know that at the time. Um, I thought he could. I thought I was going to lose my job, and Costco's a good job, a good place to work. They pay good, good benefits. And I said, I understand if you need to let me go. I do. I understand that I filled out that paperwork saying I'd work, and now I'm saying I'm not. So if you need to let me go, I understand. And then he back, oh, no, 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 We're not talking about that here. Uh, 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 we'll see what we can do. So there are two times of year when nobody gets a day off at Costco inventory. Nobody. I mean, people had their 40th wedding anniversary on that day, and they were not allowed to be gone. I'm not joking. Nobody gets out of inventory at Costco, and they're always on Saturday. The winter one was not much of an issue because the sun would set, and it was always Saturday evening, but the summer one was. And he said, I will let you have Sabbath off if one day a year you come in on Sabbath, on Saturday, and you work inventory. One day. That's all I'm asking for you. One day a year. If you do that, we'll work around this. And I said, no, I won't. I won't. Not that one day a year. He, and, he, you know, they get upset and everything. And he finally said, fine, but you come in 10 minutes after sunsets. If you're one minute later, if you're 11 minutes late, you're in big trouble. You can come in 10 minutes after the sunset. Okay, Jay, thanks. And we got out of there. And, um, and you sat in your truck leisurely. Yeah, so that one day, Ron and I would drive to, to Costco just as the sun was setting. We'd sit in his truck. We'd pray together. We'd talk together. And as the sun set, we would get out and we'd walk into Costco and everyone notices. Remember, nobody gets this off. You walk in, and they're like, what is going on? How, where have you been? And we're walking, and we're just kind of trying to look small and sheepish because we're not trying to grab attention. And just one story, and, and then we'll probably just wrap this up of that. One of those days when I'm walking in, one of uh, a coworker of ours who is, we were friends with, his name was Tim. He jumped out of an aisle and jumped right. I mean, he literally jumped out right in front of us. And we're like, we're like, what is this all about? And he wagged his finger in our face and he goes like this. How dare you do this? Don't you know that the Catholic Church has changed the Sabbath and said that you can do whatever you want? Just very aggressive. I mean, just angry. And, and we are, we're trying not to make a big deal out of it. We just said, well, you know, maybe they ought to follow the Bible. Maybe that would be the thing to do. And, um, you know, and again, you're not going to win anyone over through an arm wrestle or, or an argument. So we just kind of made our way around. And it was shortly after that that we had an opportunity for me to explore Walla Walla College at the time. And uh, we made the transition to pursue ministry. And we moved down to Walla Walla. So... Months yeah, about six months After later. Baptism. So um, God just began to open doors for us. He, he confirmed these things. There's all these way marks along the way that God just confirmed how my credits transferred, how our moving transition happened, just so many things along the way. God showed um, that he was directing. Um, a friend from the church called, and I've told this story 10 times. I'm still tearing up. Uh, he said, Dave, if you want to pursue ministry, don't let money stop you. And it was his way of saying, I will do whatever's necessary. And he did. He sponsored us all throughout seminary, making it possible for us to, to go and get that degree and, and uh, um, join the ministry. Um, so what, what do you call that? The Reader's Digest version? I mean, that's Again, over a, a two-year period or so, we just had all of these experiences crammed together, and it was, uh, it, it was an amazing time. It was an emotional time, but that's, that's kind of the basics of how we became Seventh-day Adventists. Now, we didn't just join an organization. We joined with what we felt the Lord was saying about His church in the last days. 
And the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which we're happy to be members of, is just simply a movement, a movement that aligns and is the most closely associated movement that follows the scriptures in the last days. And God has done amazing and marvelous things through many organizations. But in the last days, we think that the Seventh-day Adventist Church stands alone, stands alone for upholding the cardinal teachings of scripture in a world that is continually challenged with darkness and other things. So, in conclusion, we felt that God brought into our lives something that was lost, a lost book of the law. And we wanted to turn to follow the Lord with all of our hearts as that light came into our lives. And I hope that you have that same experience as well. Even if you've been raised in the church, even if you have been hearing about these things from cradle roll on, there is still more to learn. And even things you thought you knew with great depth, God will open up new ways of understanding it. And I hope that you will make a commitment to always follow the Lord mm -hmm. as he reveals himself through the scriptures. If you want to ask us other things, if you have a particular, like, well, how did you deal with Ellen White? How did you deal with the health met? How did you deal with, you know, state of the dead? Any of those things, you can always ask us. Uh, we, we'd love to chat with you sometime about it. Um, but we can call you. yeah, that's kind of our story. All right. Okay. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much um, for leading us the way you want us to go. And all of us have had different twists and turns in our journey. Some of us are very early on in our journey. Some of us have been on this path for many, many years. But Lord, no matter where we're at, your hand is guiding us. And you have more for us to learn, more for us to appreciate, more for us to be blessed by. So God, as we all explore our own testimonies, as we consider what your plan is for our life now and moving forward, God, would you reveal yourself to us every single day? And Lord, we know that if we look through eyes of faith, we will always see you and hear you and know that you are with us. So God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this opportunity that we could share. Bless us now as we go about the rest of your Sabbath. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sorry for going so late. I, I know you got the, the things in the oven getting burned right now. But God bless you and uh, hope that you have a wonderful Sabbath.